Hello and welcome to the Marxism Today podcast. My name is Red Wagner and I'll be your host. You are listening to episode 9, Marx's Funeral. Many introductions to Marxism involve a lengthy biography outlining each part of his life. In this podcast, I don't want to focus too much on the individual or on the particulars of his life, but today we will be looking at the funeral of Karl Marx and specifically at the eulogy which his friend and theoretical partner Frederick Engels gave there. First, a little bit of background. Marx was buried in Highgate Cemetery in London on March 17, 1883, which was a Saturday. Although he was not an obscure figure in his time, only 11 mourners attended the funeral. One of those was his colleague, Frederick Engels. He gave the eulogy at the funeral in English. Later it was published in a German newspaper, and since then it has been retranslated back into English and published in many books and, of course, on the Marxist Internet Archive. In this episode, I will perform a reading of the speech. To my knowledge, there are no other audio recordings of this eulogy, or at least none made available for free. Following the reading, I will provide some commentary and reactions. Speech at the Graveside of Karl Marx by Frederick Engels On the 14th of March, at a quarter to three in the afternoon, the greatest living thinker ceased to think. He had been left alone for scarcely two minutes, and when we came back we found him in his armchair, peacefully gone to sleep, but forever. An immeasurable loss has been sustained both by the militant proletariat of Europe and America and by historical science in the death of this man. The gap that has been left by the departure of this mighty spirit will soon enough make itself felt. Just as Darwin discovered the law of development of organic nature, so Marx discovered the law of development of human history. The simple fact, hitherto concealed by an overgrowth of ideology, that man must first of all eat, drink, have shelter, and clothing, before it can pursue politics, science, art, religion, etc. That therefore the production of immediate material means of subsistence, and consequently the degree of economic development attained by a given people or during a given epoch, form the foundation upon which the state institutions, the legal conceptions, art, and even the ideas of religion of the people have evolved, and in the light of which they must therefore be explained, instead of vice versa, as had hitherto been the case. But that is not all. Marx also discovered the special law of motion governing the present capitalist mode of production and the bourgeois society that this mode of production has created. The discovery of surplus value suddenly threw light on the problem, in trying to solve which all previous investigations of both bourgeois economists and social critics have been groping in the dark. Two such discoveries would be enough for one lifetime. Happy the man to whom it is granted to make even one such discovery. But, in every single field which Marx investigated, and he investigated very many fields, none of them superficially, in every field, even in that of mathematics, he made independent discoveries. Such was the man of science. But this was not even half the man. Science was, for Marx, a historically dynamic revolutionary force. However great the joy with which he welcomed the new discovery in some theoretical science whose practical applications perhaps it is not yet quite possible to envisage, he experienced quite another kind of joy when the discovery involved immediate revolutionary changes in industry and in historical development in general. For example, he followed closely the development of the discoveries made in the field of electricity, and recently those of Marcel de Prez. For Marx was, before all else, a revolutionist. His real mission in life was to contribute in one way or another to the overthrow of the capitalist society and of the state institutions which it had brought into being, to contribute to the liberation of the modern proletariat, which he 
was the first to make conscious of its own position and its needs, conscious of the conditions of its emancipation. Fighting was his element, and he fought with a passion, a tenacity, and a success which few could rival. His work on the first Rheinische Zeitung, the Paris Vorwarts, the Deutsche Brüsseler Zeitung, the New Rheinische Zeitung, the New York Tribune, and in addition to these, a host of militant pamphlets, work in organizations in Paris, Brussels, and London, a family, and finally, crowning all, the formation of the great International Working Men's Association. This was indeed an achievement of which its founder might have been proud, even if he had done nothing else. And consequently, Marx was the best-hated and most calumniated man of his time. Governments, both absolutist and republican, deported him from their territories. Bourgeois, whether conservative or ultra-democratic, vied with one another in heaping slanders upon him. All this he brushed aside as though it were a cobweb, ignoring it, answering only when extreme necessity compelled him, and he died beloved, revered, and mourned by millions of revolutionary fellow workers, from the mines of Siberia to California, in all parts of Europe and America. And I make bold to say that though he may have had many opponents, he had hardly one personal enemy. His name will endure through the ages, and so will his work.